Okay, off we go. All right, so uh, we're starting with Psalm 6. And uh, uh, once again, you, uh, you know, as I point out the, some of the difficulty of translating technical language, and so uh, the NRSV translates the superscription to the leader with stringed instruments according to, to the Sheminith, a Psalm of David. Well, the tradition has translated, has translated this um, to the end in the hymns of the eighth, a Psalm of David. So, uh, so yes, so St. Augustine was fascinated by what does it mean to be in the hymns of the eighth? Uh, so what do you know, it was like, what is that about? You know, so, so this was the sort of question that, that puzzled uh, St. Augustine. And so where, um, where St. Augustine's mind went and the way that the, it, the church uh, appropriated is that the, the uh, kind of the purpose or the interpretation of the psalm shifted. In its kind of literal setting, the psalm is about uh, someone who is suffering a severe illness. So that's kind of the, 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 um, the, the, the cause, the provocation of Psalm 6 is, in its original setting, again, is a severe illness. But because I think in some ways shaped by the interpretation of the superscription as uh, in the hymns of the eighth, and eight in the early church was a number that they associated with uh, the, the last day, the, the final and eighth day, because, you know, it's like history repeats, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, one, two, three, four, five, seven. And then the eighth day, again, you have that, the symbol of uh, the infinity symbol. You know, if you take an eight and you turn it over, it's infinity. And so because in, the, in, the, in that Greco-Roman world, especially in the early church, it was interpreted as, as that kind of the day that comes after the seventh day that will go on forever. Um, after the eighth day, there won't be another first day. So it became associated with, um, it became associated with the, the final judgment. And therefore, and so again, as St. Augustine and the early church, uh, when they thought of the final judgment, they thought of our sins. And so because, boy, you better get those sorted out uh, before the eighth day. You want to get your sins sorted out on like day seven. That's like a good day to get it sorted out. You know, maybe, you know, day 7.8, 7 that's a good time to have it sorted out. Day eight, too late. So um, it's a, so the, the church actually, had, this is one of the, um, the, one of the first of the seven penitential psalms. So there are seven, there are seven classic kind of in the traditional, um, you know, in the in kind of the tradition, there are seven penitential psalms and Psalm six is the first of these. And, O oh Lord, do not rebuke me in your anger or discipline me in your wrath. So um, the anger and the wrath, um, you know, it's like, you know, again, uh, Augustine and the early commentators were wondering, well, why would God be angry? Well, of course, it's because we're sinners. So, you know, it's like, so it's a good old Jonathan Edwards, you know, is a, you know, sinners in the hands of an angry, angry God, right? So um, the, the God's wrath at injustice and sin is, you know, a, a something with which patterns um, are very uncomfortable, but which basically Christians in all ages before us was like, oh yeah, that's, you got to deal with that. Uh, so that's something that we have a problem with, but earlier interpreters thought that was a normal thing to do. The Sheminith, again, we don't know. That's why they don't even try to translate it. They have no idea what the Sheminith is. Um, so uh, again, you know, that's the tradition just, you know, to the end um, in the hymns of the eighth is takes in that whole phrase, um, stringed instruments and the Sheminith. So uh, again, yeah. So I don't mean to undermine your confidence in the translation of the scriptures, however, simply to indicate that some of this is quite obscure. Uh, so, um, so the, but the, the first, uh, the first, uh, the first verse really sets the tone and becomes, in a sense, instead of 
the person's illness being the provocation of the psalm, it now becomes the person's, in a sense, con confrontation with God's demand for justice. Right? So that, in a sense, God's demand for justice, in, as the sinner approaches kind of the eighth day of judgment um, and confronts God's demand for judgment, that's the cry, oh Lord, do not rebuke me in your anger or discipline me in your wrath. And uh, again, it has the Christian, in a sense, lives every day in, in a sense that, 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 that the age to come life begins in the present for the Christian. Um, in a sense, it's, it's called a, you know, an inaugurated eschatology. That is, the, that eighth day hasn't come yet, and yet we still are called to live as if the eighth day is here. Um, both in, in a sense, both for the good and the bad. In a sense, the, in a sense, we have that eighth day confidence in the Jesus' defeat of death, but we also are called to live with kind of the reality of our own, our own sin. And so the rebuke and the discipline, St. Augustine and the early commentators comment, uh, kind of interpret in the sense of Again, Augustine, unlike, unlike the Hebrews, unlike the Israelites, the Israelites were more comfortable with God having what the Greeks would call passions, like anger and wrath. So the Old Testament, again, was much more comfortable with uh, that anthropomorphization of, of the Lord Almighty. It's like God would be wrathful or angry. Now, once the kind of, as the Greeks came into contact with Christianity, they're like, whoa, 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 whoa. God is very, very big. He doesn't get upset like we get upset. And of course, that's true, right? So the, the anger or the wrath, uh, uh, St. Augustine has an ingenious way of, uh, of explicating this. So in a sense, basically God only, so God only wants our good, right? So his analogy is God is the surgeon. Now you have to remember that in St. Augustine's day, surgeons didn't have anesthesiologists that worked with them. Right? So when you were visited by the surgeon, it was not going to be a pleasant experience. It was a, you know, it was a necessary experience. Right? You know, it's like if you needed a surgery, it was because it was the last resort. And, um, and so, uh, so when the surgeon came, he was coming because you needed his ministrations, his healing. But it was going to be painful. And so the, the, he talks about the, the wrathful cotter which would be, you know, that would be the hot, you know, the hot metal that they, you know. Um, so the, the wrathful cotter or knife of the surgeon, right? And so in a sense, it's the, it's so St. Augustine positions this psalm has the penitent sinner. Again, it's like as we, as we pray this, has faithful Christians, and, and from St. Augustine's point of view, that the penitent sinner pleads with the Lord, not to do the surgery. It's like, basically, give me some medicine. Is there a pill I can take? You know, anything but the knife, right? So um, it's a plea for mercy that the Lord would engage uh, his healing power to forgive and cleanse the sinner without the necessary, in a sense, without the extreme measures that sometimes the hardened sinner requires from a loving God. So that's, that's kind of St. Augustine's and the, how the early church moved with this, that in a sense to pray, O oh Lord, do not rebuke me in your anger or discipline me in your wrath, is not accusing God of being angry with you like, you know, if, you, you know, if, you, if somebody, a human being gets angry with someone who does something wrong, but rather the anger or wrath of God is the human experience of God's determination to save and do justice. And so it's the human encounter with the divine determination to save and do justice. And in order to save us, God must heal us.
and that can be a painful experience. And in order to make things right, God is going to have to do justice, and that is often unpleasant. And so when we encounter that in our willfulness, and this is something that I think that, 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 that Augustine brings up helpfully in the tradition, is that um, that as we as you know as willful as we are, when we come up against uh, even as willful as we are, as we come up against a divine determination to heal us of our brokenness, that in a sense we come up with against something that's a lot bigger than we are, right? And so you know even a battleship can run aground, right? You know you 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 can be a mighty battleship, but if you hit those rocks you know, is you're, they're going to get the best of you. And so in a sense, the human will is like that proud ship that runs aground against the immovable kind of nature of God's love and justice. So that's, a, you know, again, we as moderns, we don't like to think this way. But, uh, you know, if you try, if you choose to pray the Psalms of penitence as the church has received them, that's a way to step into this. It's a way of confessing to God our own willfulness and the fact that unless God has radical mercy, that the, um, the cure can be in many ways as painful as the disease um, when it comes to healing us of our sin. So, again, he, the psalmist moves right in from exactly because of this fear of the surgeon, right? Be gracious to me, O Lord, for I am languishing. O Lord, heal me, for my bones are shaking with terror. And again, so if you're going to go whole hog on the spiritual interpretation of the psalm, which I commend, because um, you know, <laughs> it's, it's like not every day that you're, that you're really sick, but most days we are sinners. So um, I might say, you know, 9.9 .9 days out of 10, we're sinners. So, um, so this, if you kind of come at it from a penitential aspect, you can pray this psalm most days of your life. Um, so to be gracious to me, to heal me for my bones are shaking with terror. The bones, again, are not physical bones, but what do bones do in your body, right? In a sense, they provide structure and support. They're kind of like the foundations of the body. And so as we move into the psalm, in a sense, we confess that our very emotional foundations are shaking with terror in light of our own finitude, right, and in awareness of our own sin. That it's, it's, a, it's the idea that we build structures um, and sometimes the structures are built for us and in us, but, some, but we often add bricks to those structures that we can build up in ourselves uh, walls or pillars or foundations um, of our own pride, of our own willfulness, of um, insensitivity to others, and that um, when we come up against our own uh, our own finitude, our own inability to save ourselves, all the, a lot of our mental assumptions start to quake with terror at our own humanness. So my soul is, all, is struck with terror while you, O oh Lord, how long? And that's the classic psalmist cry. How long is it going to take you, Lord, to come and fix this situation? Um, it's the classic cry of the lament. So the graciousness, be gracious to me, O oh Lord, to pray that God would be gracious in and of itself is a confession that God has graciousness as a fundamental or essential aspect of his character. In a sense, you, 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 you don't, it's like you don't go to, a, it's like you don't buy sushi at the gas station because that's just not part of what they do. You shouldn't do that. Right, so if you don't think God is gracious, don't pray to him to be gracious to you. If God is truly, truly wrathful, then you know, to pray for God to be gracious to you is barking up the wrong tree. But again, if we understand God's wrath has our experience of his corrective justice, 
and that his graciousness and love are really what that the essential nature of God that we can then pray in light of our own brokenness for God to be gracious to us and to heal us. And so then in turn, in, in verse four, turn, O Lord, and save my life. Deliver me for the sake of your steadfast love. And in the Greek, so two again, the word for life is psyche, right? So it's, it's not just your, it's not your heartbeat, it's not your heartbeat life. It's your psychology. It's your, it's your entire kind of personality and temperament. So save my personality because when we're talking about sin and our own injustice, uh, the, the, the soul is what is kind of where that, that's at, right? And so it's not just about our, you know, what you would, you know, sense at the carotid artery here. It's more, it's more in depth than that. Um, and so the eternal Lord, and it's kind of, you know, it's kind of the, the psalmist imagines kind of God right now is in this, in the sin of the psalmist, that God is saying, you know, Hey, talk to the hand. Um, and, uh, so we say, no, turn to me, God, look at me in your mercy. Um, and so this is a, this is a counter testimony because there are some images in the old Testament of when you say, you, you know, we pray for God to turn away. Like turn your around, but he's like, stop looking at me, you know. <laughs> like, you're like, don't stop beating me up, God. But this is actually now a prayer that it would be um, that God would turn towards us in that graciousness that we can uh, that we can count on. For in death there is no remembrance of you, and all who can give you praise. So again, in the in the Israelite conception. Right. So this is this is a this is what we know that the, what this signals is that this is a, an older hymn than Second Temple Judaism, that this psalm comes from a time before the faith and the resurrection was developed in Israel. So that's you know that. So and, and so essentially what, what has, has kind of has as we kind of reconstruct Israelite religion we begin to see a hope for resurrection in, for example, the prophet Ezekiel, the prophet of, of the exile, that the dry bones and exact, you know, Ezekiel at the, at the time as Ezekiel receives that word of the Lord, Ezekiel is probably thinking of the nation. I've got of, of those dry bones being a, a nation being raised back to life, you know, back in their, in the kingdom. But then, has the has the the exile went on, and has Israelite the Israelite faith continued to develop? That the the association of those dry bones actually became with the body itself. In a sense, the referent became real bodies that God would raise up. And so uh, we think, you know, sometime it kind of when the Israelites come back to the land. After, you know, when they're with the release from exile, sometime in that period, at some point, a, a faith in the resurrection of the body has developed among the, uh, what would become the Pharisaic party in Israelite religion. So, uh, so this psalm predates those things, predates that development, because it says, in death there is no remembrance of you. In Sheol, who can give you praise? And so Sheol is the pit. It sometimes it's translated in, in, uh, in some translation as simply the pit. In the pit, you know, um, who can give you praise? But Sheol is, again, is literally, it's like the grave that symbolizes death with a capital D. And the, the, with the faith of Israel, at that point, the Israel's like, you know, you don't come back from there. And, uh, you know, once you go in the ground, you don't come back up. And, uh, and so it's, again, in the original context, it's a prayer for deliverance from a physical illness. Like, basically, I don't want to die. I don't want to go to the pit. You know, save me, Lord, so I can go back to the temple, which is elevated, you know, on the high ground. So I want to go up to the temple to praise you, not down to the Valley of Kidron, where they bury the dead. 
Um, and uh, because, you know, there's no sound of praise down there. There's, there's praise coming from up the hill in the temple. We can hear your praise there. And I sure want, do want to be a part of that group. But I don't want to be in the basically where the jackals live. That's one of the praises of the Old Testament where jackals and that would be down in the valley. Right. Um, and uh, what are those jackals doing? Well, they're looking for poorly secured graves where that they can uh, rob of their uh, protein. So uh, that's that's what they're up to. So that's why you had to put heavy stones over the mouths of tombs. A la, you know, Easter. So that's why you put all those heavy stones is because you had um, uh, jackals, hyenas, and other creatures all looking around. You know, um, you know, sound, it smells good to me. Dinner, you know, meat's back on the menu, boys. So, um, you know, you don't want to go down to that place where the jackals are. You want to stay up in the temple. But now with the Christian faith, read this psalm now read in light of the resurrection of Jesus. The Christian church reinterprets death and shale to be um, states of what you might call the state of sin. You know, in a sense, a state of alienation from God's love. In a sense, if without an awareness and an experience of God's love, how can anyone praise you? That's the, that's the reinterpretation that especially the church kind of takes that and runs with it in the, res has the, in the resurrection of Jesus. For in death there is no remembrance of you, in shale, who can give you praise? The church will say, aha, but Jesus changed that because there will be a praise given by those who die. Therefore, uh, this has to be reinterpreted because we know that's not the case because Jesus is raised from the dead. He was raised from the tomb. And so this is actually talking about a spiritual state of relationship to God, that shale and death. And this is the kind of the chutzpah of Christian faith, right? It's like, it's like, Death, well, that's not a big deal. Now, Sheol, that's a big deal. <laughs> you know, it's like, you know, your heart stopping, well, it'll start up again in the resurrection. But being separated from God's love, well, that, that can last an eternity. That's something you need to pay attention to. So that's, that's the, the, the church's transposition of values. It's really the, the upside down way in which the church began to reinterpret the Old Testament, including the Psalms, um, which again, some Jews in, in Second Temple Judaism, again, we know from the Gospels that there were parties of Jews who did not believe in the resurrection, and they just thought this was crazy talk. Um, so both on the part of the Pharisees and on the part of Christians like Paul. So if you remember just a little while ago, as we were in doing the end of the Acts of the Apostles, and Paul would say, I'm being on trial. I'm on trial because I believe in the resurrection of the dead. And um, so that's the, uh, that's the, the, um, when we pray this Psalm, when we pray this Psalm, what we're asking God to deliver us from is a, the loss of the experience of a relationship with him. And ironically and painfully, the fact is that we need to pray this Psalm Precisely when we least feel like praying this psalm, right? you know, since when you're when you experience being far away from God, it's hard to kind of have a psalm that says, "Lord, get me close." You know, the, and because it, it, you know, it's it's really is is it speaks to the human predicament. But we have to be willing to take that step of praying to God to be gracious to us. So then, in chat, in verse six and seven. We go back to a description of the plight of the psalmist. I am weary with my moaning. Every night I flood, or in the old, in some of the old English, you know, be I drench my couch with tears. Right? Um, in the NRSV, I flood my bed with tears, but I drench my, I like, I drench my couch. Um, and uh, but uh, so, and then St. Augustine, he really hones in on this flooding stuff. It's like, it's, you know, it's kind of St. Augustine points out that if you are flooding your, you know, if you are, you know, flooding your couch with tears, it means you're really crying. 
it's not just a little like little man tear or something. It's like you are sobbing uncontrollably, you know. And so it's like Santa goes, said, "This is you're really sorry you sin, really, really sorry." So we, I drench my couch. I'm flooding my bed with tears. I drench my couch with my weeping, and uh, it's this pouring out of the soul's uh, um, desolate um, grief. My eyes waste away because of my grief. They grow weak because of all my foes. Um, and then, and so again, uh, apologies for those who, well, it's like, actually, I, I don't have to apologize now because you're like in the, in the, um, the, you're no longer a, don't think of yourself as an ARP, think of yourself as like group 1B, like awesome for you. So all of you in group 1B, uh, don't take offense because you get your shot first, okay? So, you know, so uh, it's in verse seven, the traditional translation is uh, I, that my eyes, they, they grow old in the presence of my foes. And so it's this idea that, that, that um, and so, you know, to kind of delve into this, so eyes wasting away, growing weak, and that, that the foes are spiritualized, again, has one's sins and temptations. It's just like, Lord, I'm getting weary trying to beat these darn things back. You know, like, you know, I'm just like, get, get back temptation, back sin, get away from me. And, you know, when we try to fight these things on our own, it's like we wear out, we grow old and weak in our efforts to resist sin and temptation. So it's, again, part of this is a prayer for a renewal of our strength by God's taking our side against that which afflicts us, our spiritual foes. And so then it's a command uh, where the petitioner takes on the, the boldness of trusting in the Lord and, and speaks to evil itself. Depart from me, all you workers of evil, for the Lord has heard the sound of my weeping. And so, as again, in the Psalm of Lament, this is the turn that the Lord has heard the sound of penitence and has come to the petitioner with a new consolation of God's love. And so in this new awareness, this new found manifestation of God's love within the human heart, we can with courage speak to the workers of evil, to, you know, get out of here, depart from me, you workers of evil, get behind me, Satan, right? And uh, since the, in the power of the Holy Spirit, we are given the, uh, the kind of the moxie to take it straight to sin and say, You're, I'm in charge here, not you. And uh, the Lord has given me the strength to overcome your, my own sense of separation from his love that God has done what I cannot do on my own. So get away from me, all you workers of evil. The Lord has heard the sound of my supplication. The Lord accepts my prayer. And so this is why praying these Psalms of penitence is so important because number, not only do we acknowledge our own brokenness and our own sin, but we also through these same Psalms pray in the faith that God hears us. Right? We have to be reminded, not only, and that's, what, that's really the spiritual beauty of the Psalms, is that we're reminded not only of our need for God, but also of the certainty of God's response to our need. That both things are articulated in the Psalms and lifted up to God. The Lord accepts my prayer. All my enemies shall be ashamed and struck with terror. They shall turn back and in a moment be put to shame. So it's the so now whereas you know the 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 penitent, you know, where this penitent sinner um, asks God to turn towards him, that God's turning towards him now is something that causes his enemies to flee. Uh, so the cavalry has come over the hill, and the uh, the foe of the human soul is put to flight. Um, and put to shame. So that's the that's the psalm of penitence, and that's kind of the way in which we are called to walk this path of penitence, in which it again the psalm 
uh, you know, the Psalms, that's one of the things that, you know, you, I always like with the Psalms as you pray them, that they might, they might start, um, uh, uh, you know, in a tough way. They might start on rocky ground, but they see you safely home. You know, by the time the Psalm comes to an end, it's like, okay, it's, right. it's going to be all right. It's going to be all right. You know, but, you know, you, you, you might have some sticky bits in the middle there. It's like, or it's like, ooh, that, that doesn't feel very good. And that's okay, because in the end, the psalmist will bring you safely home to a consolation of God's love. So uh, what, are some, uh, what are some of your, as we, as we read through this psalm, what are some of your uh, reactions or, or thoughts, and, or what are some of the things that come up in your mind or hearts as we went through this first penitential psalm? You can either kind of wave your hand and I'll unmute you, or you can uh, type it out if you wish, either way. Oh, yes, okay, here we go, unmute, see if this works. Come on, help me out, there we go, all right. Uh, it, um, what you said about we need to pray this psalm when we least feel like we can, like we need, like we can pray, because it just, to me hearing it, it just feels like it's, it's um, just an utter cry. Mm -hmm. Right, exactly. And, and that's really one of the ways in which the Psalms and, and praying the Psalms can really be such a blessing. Because if one is in this, the genius of this is if, this, if one is in this kind of spiritual state, finding the words to express it, may be beyond one's capacity. So we can pray these words that, that in a sense can articulate our own despair and uh, kind of make the journey with somebody who's, who's kind of made it before us. And we benefit from their narrative description. In a sense, I think uh, the Psalms, especially these kind of Psalms of lament, are a travel log of a spiritual journey. And that's one way to think about them. And it says they're, they're a travel log of a spiritual journey. They've, they've been through the nasty bits of, the, of, this, of this trail, this, of this pilgrimage road. And they can tell you, oh yeah, there's, there, you know, there's nasty, there's wild beasts and nasty animals on that turn. And you know, over here, you know, you're gonna come up against the robbers and other foes. Um, but in the end, you know, you'll get to the, where you're, to the city you long for. So, um, it really is a, the help for the traveler, um, the spiritual traveler. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, who else? Okay, well, that's okay. If you think of something, go ahead and type it up. That's all right. Um, so, uh, so Psalm 7 is uh, another uh, lament. Um, and... Uh, it's a, uh, it's what is called a, a psalm of the accused. So this is, a, so whereas psalms, you know, again, they're all laments in a classification, but some laments, your different psalms lament different things. And so Psalm 6 laments, you know, physical or spiritual sickness. But Psalm 7 laments being accused of something you didn't do. Uh, being accused of that of which you are innocent. And, uh, you know, that happens from time to time. So again, Psalms prove themselves useful in a variety of circumstances. So, um, and so the, a Shigeon of David, which he sang to the Lord concerning Cush, a Benjamite. So again, this reflects back to a story from Samuel about, you know, David being accused of breaking faith and, you know, breaking his covenant. Um, with Cush and uh, the Lord, you know, David cries out to the Lord. So this is an interesting Psalm that it's, it, in a sense, it presents itself in the tradition. It presents itself as uh, something in which kind of uh, David didn't say to anybody. He said it to himself and then wrote it down. And so uh, it already in a sense is, is presented to us as a private prayer. So it, although, you know, ironically, it's a private prayer that is then sung, set to music and sung by choirs. But, um, but anyway, it's the, 
it really Psalm seven is something that is is an interior psalm, in a sense because nobody is listening, except God. So that we enter into Psalm seven in the frame of mind that no one is listening to us, no one is hearing our side of the story, but God hears our side of the story. So we can go to God with our our, our arguments. So it begins, you know, O Lord my God, in you I take refuge. Save me from all my pursuers and deliver me. Or like a lion, they will tear me apart. They will drag me away with no one to rescue. And of course, in, the, in putting it in, in, in David's life, we, of course, we think of David's flight, right, from Saul. And so this is kind of, you can kind of historically, if you will, or narratively locate the Psalms like, oh, yes, this is David when he's on the run from Saul. And, uh, and then, then from Cush, who, you know, who accuses him of, of uh, dastardly deeds. And then, oh, Lord, my God, if I have done this, if there is wrong in my hands, if I have repaid my ally with harm or plundered my foe without cause. So this is, so what you're getting a view of here is a, um, a standard, this is a standard legal oath taking um, kind of formula. This would be like, basically, this is how, um, you know, everything, you know, is everything you're about to say, the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth, so help you God. So, but this is how Semites would do that. If I have done this, you know, you kind of like, this would be an oath you would take at the village. If I have done this, if I have repaid my ally with harm or plundered my foe without cause, then let the enemy pursue and overtake me, trample my life to the ground and lay my soul in dust. And again, that's the, you know, the, the Semites, you have to remember, it's kind of, there's a little bloody minded, frankly. I mean, you know, so they would, when they would do a legal deal, you know, a covenant was you would, you would cut a covenant right, that you would literally cut an animal in half, and the two of you would walk through the, the sacrificial victim, and you would say, may thus and so be done to me, and much more if I should break the word of my covenant. And that's, that's, how, that's how deals were done, right, is like basically, so if I, if I don't get you the grain on time, you know, I'm betting my life on it. I mean, that's, hey, that's life in the Semite world. That's, you know, that's, that's where they would take it. So, um, so this, the, this oath to affirm, as this is a solemn oath that the psalmist takes upon himself. Um, and it's basically saying, I'm betting my life. I, Lord, I bet my life with you that if I've done something wrong, then let the enemy pursue and overtake me. Trample my life to the ground and lay my soul in the dust. Now, uh, I remember we, we had a psalm, um, or there was a psalm kind of like this where it's, um, you know, where, I, the, where we read it in, when I was doing my Wednesday uh, class with the fellas um, and uh, the, my Bible study, and it was kind of uh, like, I washed my hands in innocence, you know, I, I have, basically a psalm says, I haven't done anything wrong. And what, one, of the, one of the guys asked, um, I got to say, I'm a little uncomfortable praying this psalm because, you know, I, I mean, I'm, I'm not presenting myself as a perfect person. You know, I, I mean, I'm not an innocent person. So how are we supposed to pray this? And so, again, entering into the psalm spiritually, so you have the original referent, right, the original kind of case in, that provoked it or its original setting and its culture but then as the Christian, uh, 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 you know, appropriates it, um, then we, in a sense, we can say these words in light of Jesus's innocence. So in a sense, on the one hand, Jesus himself is innocent and Jesus can say these words. And so as we are united to Jesus and are forgiven by him, we may be found innocent of that which we have committed. So in a sense, Jesus is, we can pray this with and alongside Jesus, trusting in his forgiveness. Um, so, you know, then let the enemy pursue and overtake me. Again, for David, this would have been Saul, but for us, it's our own, um, our own sins and temptations. Trample my life to the ground, lay my soul in the dust. Rise up, O Lord, in your anger. Lift yourself up against the fury of my enemies. Awake, O oh my God, you have appointed a judgment. Let the assembly of the peoples be gathered around you. 
and over it take your seat on high. The Lord judges the peoples. Judge me, O Lord, according to my righteousness and according to the integrity that is in me. So, the, the, again, the setting here is we have to remember that, that um, in most of Israel, again, now in Jerusalem, in the capital city, you would have kind of more of a court system. Uh, but in most villages, right, uh, trial, court cases, trials, they were done at the gate of the, of the village. And basically the whole village came around because there might be a hanging. And so, you know, it's like everybody comes around to listen and to provide, you know, testimony, and the elders would take their seats, the ones who would be making the decision, and, you know, their decision would be final. Um, and, you know, again, it's not like um, they can send you away to a penitentiary for 20 years. It's kind of like, you know, do we stone him now or fine him or cut off his ear? Well, I mean, it's, you know, they're, they're all, like, there could be a lot of really bad outcomes, you know, if you are falsely accused. You're in deep water. You are truly in deep water. So the prayer here in its context is basically praying that God would assume his seat in the middle of the elders who are judging the case. It's acknowledged that God is the true judge and that the assembly of the peoples would be gathered around God rather than around human judges. And that the Lord judges the peoples Judge me, O Lord, according to my righteousness and according to the integrity of me. So here we come up against the Old Testament um, a meaning of righteousness, which is not, again, as I've said before, I'll say it again, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's important to hear it correctly. Righteousness in the Old Testament is not moral excellence. And it's important because we have to understand that when Paul talks about righteousness, that Christ's righteousness, that we receive Christ's righteousness, is the, the first meaning, like if in a, in a dictionary definition, like the first definition is not moral excellence. That's like down in the paragraph. That might be definition like four, you know, back in the day. You know, you know it's, like, uh, it's, it's like if this were a youth group, I'd say, children, there was a day when we had something called a dictionary, and there would be several different definitions of a word, and you had to, like, go to the page and spell the first three letters correctly to find it even. So, anyway, so uh, that moral excellence was not the key meaning of righteousness. The first definition, the main definition of righteousness is covenant faithfulness. Remember, we're in the context of oath-taking, of cutting covenants, and so a righteous person was somebody who basically kept up his end of the bargain, right? Who, who delivered when he said he would. And um, that righteousness was about, you know, fulfilling your end of an agreement. And uh, the classic case of this is um, with, uh, with um, uh, now I'm, I'm blanking, it's going to be, oh, yes, uh, uh, Tamar and Judah, I believe, it, back in, the, in Genesis. And it, it's, it's one of those stories we don't tell Sunday school children. But basically, so um, uh, Perez dies, Judah's son Perez dies. And so uh, his wife Tamar, um, basically, uh, you know, they haven't had any children yet. And she wants to, you know, have children within the family line. And so she disguises herself as a prostitute and she gets Judah to come over and take up her up on her services. And then later she's found to be pregnant. Oh, you know, the widow of Perez is pregnant before she, you know, she couldn't possibly have gone pregnant. And so they take her out to stone her. But, but good old Tamar had the presence of mind to take as payment Judah's staff right? Say, I'll take your staff as payment. So then they're about to stone her. And she says, the guy who got me pregnant is the guy who goes with this staff. And then, and then Judah, who's organizing the stoning, right, has the elder of the village basically says, uh, yeah, that, that is my staff. Um, and so he says, he says to Tamer, you are more righteous than I. In a sense, because Tamar has kept up her covenant with the family, that she, in a sense, that Judah wouldn't give her another one of his sons. And so basically Tamar is taking her own, you know, her own faithfulness in her hands. It's like, 
by golly, I'm going to be faithful to my covenant to the family, even if you won't let me. And that was righteous of her. Now, again, in our, in our modern context, that would in no, neither Judah nor really Tamer, none of the people involved would be morally excellent as far as we've received those terms really from the Greeks and others, you know, from the, from the Christian tradition. But she's righteous. And that's what it means to be righteous. It means that you fulfill your oath no matter what. And so when we say that God is righteous, it's not necessarily that God is morally excellent. Well, of course he is. He's God. He can do whatever he wants, really. He's excellent. So um, it's that God fulfills his promise no matter what. That's what God's righteousness is. Right? And so when, we, so when Paul talks about Christ's righteousness being imputed to us, it means that basically... Jesus fulfills humanity's end of the bargain when we could not and accepts death has the just punishment. Like you remember cutting of a covenant. So Jesus accepts the consequences of the breaking of the covenant between God and humanity by humanity. And that that righteousness and since Christ's righteousness is not about necessarily Jesus telling everybody to love each other and forgive each other. It's about the fact that Jesus owned up to the consequence on behalf of all humanity, received it in his own person, and then we, we received, in a sense, in, in the corporatist understanding of identity, which is biblical as opposed to Western individualism, when we are incorporated into Christ, in a sense, he becomes our attorney, if you will, in the covenant proceedings, and we gain the benefit of his willingness to go follow through on the agreement no matter what. So even though we couldn't, we receive Jesus's faithfulness, his righteousness. Okay, so the judge me, O Lord, according to my righteousness and according to the integrity that is in me is a way of the petitioner saying, Lord, I'm trying to keep my covenant with you. I'm trying to hold up my end of the bargain with you, Lord. Not necessarily with others, but I'm going to be faithful to you. And so uphold me and judge me according to how I've been faithful to you. And again, we receive Jesus' own faithfulness as, as ours in our baptism into his death and resurrection. And so then in verse 9, Oh, let the evil of the wicked come to an end, but establish the righteous who test the minds and hearts, oh, or you who test the minds and hearts, O oh, righteous God. God is my shield who saves the upright in heart. God is a righteous judge. Again, don't hear that as morally excellent judge. Hear that as a judge who follows through on what he promises to do. And God is a God who has indignation every day. Well, who couldn't help but have indignation when you just look at human beings all the time? So, um, you know, since God is looking at humanity, he's indignant because he is keeping his covenant, but human beings aren't keeping theirs. And so that's what we're called to, you know, to uh, approach God on that ground. If one does not repent, God will wet his sword. He is bent and strung his bow. He has prepared his deadly weapons, making his arrows fiery shafts. See how they conceive evil and are pregnant with mischief and bring forth lies. They make a pit, digging it out, and fall into the hole that they have made. I mean, there's a, I think there's a proverb about that, right? It's like falling into your own hole, um, you know, falling into the pit that you yourself have dug. Well, that comes from the Psalms. Um, and their mischief returns upon their own heads, and on their own heads, their violence descends. So, uh, again, this reinforces what we've discovered in our Psalms from last week, which is the, the, the fundamental kind of moral logic of the Psalm is that evil consumes itself. And this is something that, that Augustine would, would go with, too, in a sense that the, the classic Christian formulation of evil following uh, Augustine was one of the first who really kind of worked this out in a systematic way is that evil is in a sense a evil is a nothing 
It's a, uh, if you will, um, it's kind of like, it's like the number zero. I mean, zero isn't really a number, isn't it? Or is it? I mean, it's like, it, it's nothing. Zero is nothing. You don't, if you have zero, you have nothing. But you, yet we have this number called zero that can still perform certain properties and equations, right? This, if you remember back to algebra, right? Uh, so it's like, Mr. Munson would be so proud of me that I'd be like, I'm bringing in algebra into my life. Um, so, so, you know, because Christopher says, I'll never use this. I'm like, well, you could be a priest, you know, then you have to use that as an illustration. So, um, so you can inflict algebra on helpless Christians. So, um, but, you know, so it's like the number zero is, it is in a one sense nothing, on the other, in the other sense it has powers and properties when you put it into equations. That's how evil is. That evil is fundamentally nothing, and yet it does have effects when you put it into the mix of humanity, in a sense, the moral mix. And, um, but that, that nothingness, in a sense, consumes itself. Uh, if you think the, a great line from uh, King Lear, where he says to Cordelia at the very beginning, he says, you know, what, what do, you know, basically, what do you have to say? And Cordelia says, nothing. And then Lear says, nothing, nothing comes of nothing. I speak again. Right? It's this idea that, that nothing consumes itself and all around it. So in a sense that evil and evil people are kind of zeros that we all that in a sense will kind of cluster together and cancel each other out and off they go leaving right whole integers so you know leaving the redeemed the restored the forgiven in a in blessedness and so in a sense the the prayer the moral logic of the psalmist who who cries out has the innocent suffer is that um in a sense that the classic destiny of evil is to fall into the pit that evil itself has dug. Um, and it's, and it's more than just, it's, it's a, it's a deeper way of saying, it's not just like, you know, Hey, karma, baby. Um, it's, it's, it's a little deeper than just like, Hey, Hey, you know, it's just what goes around comes around. It's much more like, you know, remember a pit is death, right? So they tried to dig a pit. They tried to cause others to die, but ultimately spiritual death is what's coming for them. You know, they may be able to kill the innocent sufferer, right? But the pit into which they throw the innocent sufferer, God is capable of raising them up. But they themselves are headed for a pit that's going to close in on top of them upon their own heads as their violence, you know, kind of, it's kind of like an avalanche that kind of a, a rock fall that kind of buries them in their own violence, um, you know, like if they're in a tunnel. And then the, the final word of affirmation is, again, it's the psalmist. You know, he always wants to bring us back home safe. In verse 17, I will give to the Lord the thanks due to his righteousness and sing praise to the name of the Lord, the Most High. So, again, there's that final affirmation and in, in faith in the Lord's covenant faithfulness. A trust that God is going to do what God says God's going to do. And God has said he would rescue the innocent sufferer. And so the innocent sufferer cries out. And so, um, in a sense, our innocence, it's like, oh my goodness, well, I don't feel particularly innocent most of the time. Our innocence is a way of talking about our human vulnerability to evil. In a sense, it's like an innocent child. I mean, ch children can be naughty, right? um, but in the also they're powerless. They're they're de they're utterly dependent, and in that sense, children can be innocent, right? even if they're naughty. And the in the same way as we stand before God in our powerlessness, in our human mortality, we possess an innocence. That in a, the faith of the psalmist is that we possess an innocence because of our own vulnerability, our ability to be wounded, that calls forth mercy from a loving God. You get what I'm saying there? I mean, it's, it's kind of, it, it's, it's, 
it, you know, again, it's not, a, a, it's not natural for modern Americans to think in these terms, but this is the psalmist way of thinking about God's view of humanity. Right. And it kind of is what the psalmist is doing. It's really a spiritually creative exercise. It's kind of like, what does humanity look like from God's point of view? And, and in a sense, we look to God like innocence because we're vulnerable to violence. And so we cry out to God in a trust that God will fulfill his promise to save the innocent, not the morally excellent. That's not necessarily a key category for the psalmist right now again for the you know in the new testament you know yes there's all this love stuff right i mean so you know like you know so so paul there's this moral excellence that is to be desired in a virtue ethic of the christian faith but i think in some ways the psalmist is something that can be a leaven in that loaf by reminding us that you know sometimes moral excellence is really beyond our capacity to offer and even if we don't have, you know, even if we don't feel we bring to God a morally excellent case that we're not righteous in that sense, we can be faithful in our trust in God's own promise to save us in our weakness. And that the God we know in the God of Israel is a God who, for whatever reason, known only to him and strange to human reasonings, seems to favor the weak and seems to have a soft spot for the vulnerable and the suffering, which is not like the other pagan gods out there. Believe you me, other pagan gods don't have a whole lot of patience for weakness and for losers and for suffering. But the God of Israel seems to be a God who has his eye on the guy who's all by himself being accused at the town gate of something he didn't do. That God is that guy's God. He's not the God of the elders. He's not a God of the mob. He's not a God of the railroaders, right? He is the God of the person who's all by themselves and powerless in their situation. That's the God of the Bible, right? And ultimately that's the God revealed in Jesus himself precisely when he is alone, on the cross and faced and faced by the elders of his people who hurl uh, insults and accusations against him right in the middle of a big crowd and a mob that that's see that's the consistency between the old testament the psalmist witness and the god we see in jesus is god stands with the one who suffers alone um, and unjustly